We are live, Mr. Chairman. The floor is yours. Good afternoon. Welcome to the September 22nd edition of the White Cliffs Committee meeting, uh, pursuant to Senate Bill 2985 as amended, a bill to extend certain COVID-related amendments to the open meeting law as modified by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, permitting remote meetings and participation until March 31, 2023, signed into law on July 16, 2022. This meeting will be conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance by members of the public will be permitted. This meeting will be live streamed, but will not include public participation. So welcome. All right, any opening remarks from John or anybody else? We've got minutes to approve and then uh, Brett Pelletier will be joining us. Anybody have any issues with the minutes from September 7th, 2022? They look good for me. Does that count as a motion? Yes, I'll make a motion to approve the meeting minutes. I'll Don't second. Uh, all right. So, uh, motion made by Norm to accept, seconded by Tom. All those in, well, if there's any other discussion. Um, Norm? Yes. Uh, Julianne? Miss Staney, I wasn't there. Good. That was a trick question. Tom? Yes. Diana? Yes. Also, yes, and I also vote yes. All right, that's done with that. So I guess we'll turn it over to Brett. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, so I have um, prepared and sent around the draft um, RFP language for all of you to review. I've had some comments from staff already, which have been incorporated into the most recent draft. Um, I thought this would be a good opportunity to sort of introduce it to you, um, answer any preliminary questions or uh, make notes of any preliminary comments um, and give you ample time uh, to review it at your, um, at your leisure in the coming days and, and send formal comments um, as we inch our way closer to the, um, the, to the um, deployment of the, of the RFP. And we have some logistical things I think we should talk about as well. Um, John, is there anything that um, you wanted to start off with, or is that a good way to approach this from your perspective, from admin? Yeah, so I've got some, you know, I've got some language that I'm I'm working on in terms of there, there's some legal framework that needs to take place here. A couple of things, you know, this is a little bit unique. Normally, when a town is going to surplus a piece of property. You get the authorization from town meeting, uh, think of like 13 you know, uh, Church Street, the old fire station, get the authorization, then you move forward. Uh, this one here, you know, we we are moving, I'm going to say it's not it's not backwards. It's a it's a natural progression. But it, but we do need to be clear and transparent in terms of this process that, you know, the White Cliffs Committee, this group is just an advisory committee. Uh, we don't really have authority to, to, to make any decisions. So the way this would work is we're working on this process with Brett. Uh, we would come back, evaluate the proposals, make a recommendation to the Board of Selectmen. Board of Selectmen then you know, would be subject to their review and approval, and then it would need to go to town meeting. If we were going to, anything dealing with real property needs to go through town meeting for approval, be it a long-term lease, an easement, buying or selling property. So, so the idea is that this committee would do the groundwork, review, make a recommendation to the Board of Selectmen, Board of Selectmen would then take it up. Uh, and then ultimately it would have to be packaged into, uh, into a town meeting warrant. Uh, so uh, it would need, it would certainly need, need town meeting approval to, to uh, sell the property. Uh, as well as, like I said, into, into a lease or, or any of those options. But in addition, if the town were to entertain a tax increment financing agreement, a TIF, this would be something uh, whereby if an investor came in and made improvements to the building, that the town could, uh, through this uh, through a TIF agreement process, basically forgive uh, any taxes on the improvements. That again, would require board of selectmen approval and then ultimately town meeting approval. 
Clearly, any other funding opportunities like the community preservation, if that were going to be a factor, that too would require town meeting approval. So, so it's a little bit complicated. I just want to make sure on the front end that we're explaining that, providing the appropriate legal references. So uh, I'm working on that, um, uh, on that piece right now that would come in on the front end. Uh, and then uh, staff is working on the sequencing of the uh, timing of when it would be advertised, the walkthroughs, the deadlines for things to come back. Uh, so we'll put something together because, we, again, we have to back up from the statutorily required advertisements. And we also want to make sure with Brett's console, uh, how, what, how long do we want to leave this out there before we close it? You know, we need certain time frames where if there are questions that there's an opportunity to provide answers, we need to make sure we answer all the questions to all of the potential proposers. So, uh, so those details still need to be uh, completed. Uh, so we're working on that schedule piece of it. In, in terms of today, you know, there's the general write-up of the introduction of, of, the, of the process, of the parcel. I mean, obviously that can go on for 25 pages if you wanted to. We have such great documentation in the feasibility report that was completed by DBVW uh, under the uh, oversight of this committee. That report has all the information that we really have in one place. And that's where we're directing people to. But, you know, there's a couple paragraphs of summarizing, you know, kind of where we are and uh, what we're trying to achieve with this, uh, with this process. Um, one of the things that I would like to talk about today, uh, cause I wasn't sure how to, to um, address it is, you know, Brett has a section on resources. You know, we're not, I don't know, we should have a discussion about what do we include there? Mm -hmm. Because anything that the town could bring to bear in terms of uh, per, per, uh, additional assistance financially, you know, I'm, I don't, I don't, I don't know that we want to. We can't commit anything, and I don't know that. I mean, I, in my opinion, we might want to delete that out and let the proposer come back with, you know, you know, what is the funding gap, and how would they propose to close it, or what, what might they be seeking in terms of potential assistance from the town. Otherwise, the, the real nuts, uh, the, the real meat of this, as far as the committee's input is, is, is concerned, is the, um, is the project evaluation criteria. So these are the things that we've been discussing for the last several meetings. Um, you know, the, the criteria, the weight, that piece of it, I think that's really where we want to spend a, a little bit of time talking about today. So um, that makes sense. And um, I think I, I defer to you a little bit on that, or for primarily on that, John, about resources. I think it initially, I, my thought is it's important to signal to um, potential responders that the town is serious about um, this process, even though it doesn't have town meeting approval, and we're going to get that later. If so, it, you know, this is a process that sort of comes after this, but. Um, to sort of mitigate that a little bit, that risk to say, hey, look, you know, and, and we've done that in the zoning section that we're, you're, you're working on upzoning this, this parcel, um, that you've got all of these documents, the master plan and the downtown revitalization program, that, that you are serious about this. So I'm going to think harder about whether deleting that makes sense, that section on resources. But my, my initial thought was just, discuss what the town has done in the past. Um, and then with a, with a note that says, you know, this is any and all town participation would be subject to um, town meeting and there's by no means any guarantee. Um, think about that a little harder. I will think about that a little harder. If that's, yeah. um, I just think it, we just need to be careful that we're yeah. not a, a basically out of the gate saying, yeah, yeah, we're gonna. We've got. We're gonna put as you know my, more money towards this this project because I don't know that we we know that we are there or not. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other is that you know the re realistically the funding sources moving forward in all likelihood would be the the primary one would be the, the CPC funding, uh, mm -hmm. and and we want to be very careful that we're not stepping forward and you know and committing other boards and committees that haven't even had a chance to discuss this. And we don't have any information to share with them really at this point. So, so that's why that's, uh, that's why I just sort of 
I just we, I just left it highlighted. I think um, perhaps that's a better opportunity for sort of an offline conversation with people when they ask questions. We can we can direct them to what historically has happened, um, and and those boards and commissions, and sort of leave it at that. That way, we're not. It doesn't look like we're sort of winking and nodding and saying we have earmarked funds for this uh, going forward that haven't been. Yeah, and any any additional, even through the CPC, a TIF mm -hmm. agreement, or you know, those all would require town meeting action. Mm -hmm. uh, the only one that wouldn't would would be if the board of selectmen decided to use some ARPA funding. But that that too, in my opinion, is premature. The board hasn't uh, That's fine. continued those discussions yet. So, and honestly, I'd like to hear from the proposers in terms of mm -hmm. you know their let, let's see what they come up with and let's see what they identify as a potential funding gap and, and what are the options for, for closing that gap? Mr. Chairman, you got a hand hanging up uh, in uh, Mr. Corbin. You're on mute, Todd. Just gonna say, what's up, Norm? Uh, actually, this is, goes back to when we started our conversation. There's, there's one point that's, uh, I, I took a brief look at the document you sent out, uh, John. Uh, there's one thing I want to make sure is very clear because it's getting murky. The properties of the White Cliffs is over seven acres. It is not six and a half. Remember, there's a second lot that we purchased that was 0.6 acres right adjacent to it. And it's coming up more and more that it's six and a half. I think we got to make sure we're consistent with that property. It's, um, it, it, yes, you're, you are correct. Yeah. Okay. Does, does, everybody, does everybody know where that lot is? Is everybody familiar with it? So let me, if I can share, I can just pull this up because I want to nip that one in the bud. It's coming up a little too much. I think um, it's just a hiccup that keeps getting carried forward. Yeah. Well, and, and it's, it's also it's a hiccup because of people who are watching this. So this is, uh, you're looking at the map of the area? Did that yep. work out? Okay. So this is, the, this is a six and a half acre lot. And this is the 0.6 acre lot that we also own right here. Okay. All right, just want to make sure we're all on that page because I honestly I don't want to see six and a half written anywhere anymore. Thanks. Mm -hmm. That's, That's where Norm's gonna build his house. He's gonna be the caretaker. I don't need another house, believe me. I got I got uh, challenges already. I will make that change. That's all I had. All right, you want to drop your screen, Norm? Uh, stop share, got it. Thank you. I have a question. Um, if we're just asking general questions right now, it says that there is no current um, preservation status on the property. It did did no preservation status come with CPC approval? So the way the way it stands at this point, uh, Julian, is that um, we purchased it using CPC funds, so we know that a, a formal permanent preservation restriction needs to be placed on it. Essentially, by our purchase, we have by our purchase and ownership, we purchased it to preserve it. So uh, there is no formal restriction on it uh, yet, but there will be one placed on it. There has to be one placed on it. There has to be one placed on it. Yes. Right. Okay. And we've had discussions about wanting to get a little further into this process and not prematurely place a restriction that might prohibit a, 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 a respondent uh, from being able to use the property productively. Both DBVW as well as Brett sort of advised us to, to hold off on that. And that's something that would be negotiated uh, as part of this process. Clearly, the town wants to get as much in terms of preservation as it can get. And uh, but if you go too far, if you said, hey, this thing has to be brought back to its former glory and all the additions ripped off and nobody's it's not going to be a viable project for anybody. So so that's a that's a piece in there that would be negotiated as part of this process. OK, and that would be understood by the prospective buyer or partner. Yes, I mean, it's explicit as drafted right now in here. The fact that we use CPC funds, it's not it's not negotiable. There needs to be a preservation restriction. Yeah, 
we, we want to shift to um, our, our evaluation criteria and, and sort of scoring metrics. Sure. So um, starting on page nine, there's project evaluation criteria. And I, and I broke this down into um, sort of um, two basic categories. We have the sort of deep narrative on the, the five um, metrics that you all identified as sort of the primary drivers of your, um, of, of your decision-making and thinking on this, which is the first being the restoration and preservation of the structure. The, sec the second is the reduction of municipal burden. Uh, the third, landscaping and natural sort of site uh, improvements. Uh, the fourth being uh, public access or sort of some enhanced uh, relationship within the community. And then the fifth is sort of consideration of that master plan and, down, and uh, downtown revitalization strategy. And then we break it, I've broken it further into sort of showing how I would propose that the committee evaluate those um, items. Um, and the first include the first section is uh, basically a criteria on or a, way, uh, a scoring on the team submission. Um, you know what is the the team or the the respondent? Who are they? What are they? What are their qualifications? What's their background and experience? Um, you know bios of members of the team, and then professional references, which we intend to check. Um, and follow up on as a scoring criteria. Um, you know, just I, I like to keep in a, a section that just asks for any you know lawsuits or any actions that have been brought up uh, against the principals or the team members, just to make sure we're not um, we're not missing uh, an important criteria. We don't want to be negotiating with someone who's um, had a lawsuit on every project they've ever worked on. And then um, following up with interviews uh, um, of those individuals or those teams. Ex excuse me, Brett, could I make a recommendation? You, you may. Is, is there any way you can share the screen with that document? Oh, sure. I uh, think that see. would be helpful for all of us. Bear with. I cannot, I don't have, oh, there we are. I do have permission. Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Uh-oh. Nothing's coming through yet. Okay. There we go. Great. Yeah, I had a, a glitch that I just went blank for a second. All right, so let's go back up and I can kind of walk through this. So we have the project evaluation criteria, which are those fundamental five items that we've been discussing for weeks now. And then there's a little description of each of them. Um, and uh, you know, to give sort of the, the guide, some guidance on what we what we're thinking about and what we're looking for in those criteria. And they're a little bit; those are sort of the softer criteria. They're less of the check the box. You have submitted, you know, all of these items, these these punch list items. But rather, these are the softer things. That how are you going to um, create this sense of public uh, relationship or um, or public access? How are you going to uh, incorporate the master plan and the downtown revitalization strategy into your proposal. And then we have these, um, basically the, the, how we will measure success or how we propose to measure success. And, you know, I've done a very simple, we, we, you know, the feedback I got from, from folks early on was let's not get overly complicated with 15 layers of grading, but rather Let's make it simple. So we've gone from a zero through three uh, metric or rubric where unacceptable gets no points, um, less advantageous gets a point, advantageous gets two points, and highly advantageous gets three points. Very simple, very straightforward. And so each of these numbered um, uh, sub uh, categories or, or sub um, criteria will be awarded a maximum of up to three points. And so this first round of team submission um, is, is worth 12 points total. Each of the, each of the five 
um, major criteria that we established are each worth three points. And so that has the sort of the weight of, of, of that. How, how well do these um, responses uh, address these really important critical criteria? And then the sort of um, the last is a proposal criteria guidance that we, what we're looking for and how well we, are these respondents addressing the basic, um, you know, meat and potatoes of the, the sort of the admin, the, the, the bulk of the, the logistical um, part of the, the proposal, project summary, what are you going to do? How are you going to do it? What's your strategy for fi financing it? Um, what's your operational strategy? W what is your financial consideration to the town, um, if any? Uh, and then basic project feasibility. We're, we're not getting too heavy on the requirements. I'm, I'm trying to use these as somewhat um, benchmarks for, you know, people get creative. We want people to present us something that we may not have thought of or may not have fit into our box. And we can use that if, if, they, if they send a one page that has three bullet points and says, we're gonna pay for it, don't worry about it, everything's fine. We throw those guys out, right? They're just, they've self-selected out for the most part because they haven't provided um, a level of detail that is sufficient to meet um, what we expect. We don't know exactly what that looks like until um, we get it, but we'll know it when we see it if it makes if it makes sense and if it's realistic. Um, and those three are the, the project summary, as discussed, the feasibility. Um, I've put a couple of notes in here. We we want to see sources and uses. Um, as detailed as possible so we can understand the feasibility of the proposal. If it just says we're going to spend $10 million and we're going to get $10 million in financing, don't ask too many questions, that's different than having someone think about hard about where their, where their funding is going to come from. And that fits into that, that, um, that bullet point that John was talking about earlier about resources if they come and say, hey, here's, we're gonna put an earmark in here for CPA funds, or we're gonna put an earmark in here for, um, for some, some town contribution in the future, that's a good opportunity to, to understand where they're coming from on that. And I put in here, you know, letters of interest from funding sources and partners are welcome, <coughs> but not required. You wanna pr provide us some additional information to show you that you've really thought about this and you're ser you have some seriousness of intent, we're happy to look at those, but they're not required. And then this last catch-all is the general discussion of community benefits. How are you going to make this, um, this, this proposal benefit the community as much as possible? And so those are the criteria. There's um, you know, uh, three main areas, a total of 12, 15, and nine points. Um, and I leave it up to, uh, I will open it up to discussion if that's um, good with the chair for any questions or comments or suggestions. Oh, These should, reflect, reflect. These should yeah. reflect the, the, the discussions we've had previously. Um, you know, I went back through notes of every meeting that we've had to kind of compile all of the little um, little bits that we've talked about to try to make sure we've covered all of the sentiment of the committee in our in our um, our RFP. Oh, if I may, one, one thing that I'm concerned about is the downtown revitalization strategy uh, and design report hasn't been written yet. Mm -hmm. It's in the very preliminary stages. We're just uh, getting off the ground with that project. So I'm concerned that uh, we just don't have enough meat yet uh, to reference. So I wonder if we should just focus on the master plan, which includes uh, quite a bit of discussion about downtown. Brett, can you drop your screen so we can all oh, see sorry. each other again, please? Um, again, through the, through the chair, you know, my suggestion would, on that would be to include a link to the master plan and include a link to at least the RFP uh, for the downtown uh, visualization so they can see what we're trying to accomplish. And that's all the information we have at the moment. And, uh, and, and, and presumably we'll have 
we, we, those those folks responding will make contact with the town, whether it's through Lori or through the committee to try to make, um, to try to understand what the process is, what the timeline is and, and how the, the committee envisions that process playing out and the results of it. It doesn't have to be defined explicitly, but we want them to be, be making, we want to make sure that they are paying attention to what's going on. Um, so that makes sense. So, Brett, I, I do have a, a through the chair again another que uh, a, a question. I'm not quite sure how we handle this, and um, you know, a big piece of this is you know you want uh, people who are going to give you the best proposal, but they have to have the financial wherewithal to pull off whatever it is they're proposing. Mm -hmm. And um, so, how do we go about as a committee evaluating someone's uh, financial credibility in terms of being able to deliver? what it is that they are, are proposing. Um, you know, I've done various projects where we've asked people to submit financials. I mean, somebody has to review those. Um, uh, you know, we ask for letters of commitment from financial institutions that, you know, somebody has access uh, to, you know, financing um, or either self-funded or in this case, I doubt it'd be self-funded, but uh, yeah, basically how do we, how do we go about, you know, if we're going to hone in on a particular proposer, proposal, um, you know, how do we on our side uh, do our due diligence to make sure that these people have the wherewithal to actually pull this off? And at what stage does that occur? Does that occur in the initial selection or after we start getting into nuts and bolts about entering into some kind of an agreement? Yeah, I think it, it's a, it's a dissuading um, factor early on, certainly. If, if all things considered, you, you know, and I'm just being blunt here, you don't have the right to sell this property yet. And so um, how much energy and effort and time and money am I going to spend on a proposal that is still a little bit unclear if, it, if there is a path to success from a, from a developer or an owner's perspective? And so I think if we ask for too much information, we get down the due diligence rabbit hole of submitting financial statements for the team and um, all, all of these um, requirements and letters of support from, from funding sources, et cetera. I, I, I'm not sure um, we're, gonna, we're gonna find success there early on. 60 days, is, and, and that's the window we're proposing, is not a long time to figure out what the heck to do with a very yeah, so I just want I'm just trying to confirm with you then that we're not going to try to get that done in this phase. No. It would be after we've sort of narrowed down and selected and start negotiating yes. really the, the agreement and the process. That's when that material would be. Yeah, we should have a color of what their capacity is from their previous project experience and their general, you know, the general level of their their pro forma and their feasibility exercise. Um, and then once we get into a, a further stage, it'll be, yeah, it'll be helpful to test capacity even further. Is it possible that the interview stage would be a time when we could get a bit more information on their financial situation? I mean, I don't know if you, do you issue a list of specific questions to interviewees or are you just planning on having them come sort of elaborate in public on their proposal? And that's also up for discussion. It's it's partly what I want to get out of the process, but it's also partly what the committee wants to get out of the process because you're ultimately going to be the the voting body that recommends um, something to to the board of selectmen. But you could, we could. I think a lot of it's going to depend on what we get, Diane. Diane mm -hmm. is, is you know, sure. uh, and it's I think it might some questions I think would be similar, but. Um, but you can get very uh, divergent proposals that you're going to have a lot of questions. That what will be interesting for how we craft that uh, process. But I do think one of the things that I did suggest, Brett, uh, including here, is we have to have an interview process. We need to sit down and talk to these people and and uh, and and, find, and flush things out a little bit further to see if we feel comfortable that this is the right fit in the right direction for the town. And D Diana, it's not uncommon with a um, broad. Uh, response um, scope to have specific bulleted topics 
uh, pre-interview given to the specific firms. They may not all touch on the exact same basis in the proposal. So uh, a canned questions for each respondent that we interview is not likely going to get us what we need. Um, so, so I've experienced not... both in the public sector. Sometimes when I interview, I do get a specific list, but, you know, a specific list relating to my proposal. Other times I get a general list. I guess my point overall is that it seems that the interview is a point at which we can ask for some additional level of detail beyond what they've already submitted. So it doesn't even have to be a letter of questions, but I would expect for us to have additional criteria at that point in time. Not Especially, necessarily outline criteria, I don't mean criteria specifically, but we need to know more about what's behind the board. Yes, and, and, and it's also a funnel process, uh, you know, if, Let's just be hopeful. You know, we get seven seven proposals, and and we uh, and we're really focused on two. You know, uh, so obviously you want to get more information out of that next stage of the uh, process to inform your decision making. Absolutely, as and opposed to we're going to interview everybody. Right, and I think if if you're you know this also matters very much um, what responses you get, but I think there may be a um, sort of a tranched approach that you know, your first round you may. Um, whittle yourself down to a, a one or two or three. Um, and then after that um, process, you can really require additional information. So it's hard to ask for, um, for too much detailed information as a public body with folks who sometimes don't feel comfortable sharing that um, in a public space. And if they're not in contention really anyway, that's even worse. Um, you know, they have less motivation to participate. So uh, I guess I thought it was great. Um, these things are, with all due respect to people that wrote it or write them regularly, they're usually boring and awful. And this one was a lot less boring and awful than most. <laughs> I thought it was I thought it was pretty crisp. Um, we're trying to cast a broad net here. I think simpler, less than, you know, less is more in this respect. And I kind of thought it struck a positive note um about the process so I, I actually i think it's on the the right track and i think you guys can probably the staff can massage it and brett can get it into a place it needs to be the nice thing is and this is is that a lot of stuff that would clutter up a rfp like this trying to get information in uh into the document we have it all as standalone through the website with the work that we've done to build to this so that's why you have the links that have been included in the back by Brett that just, you know, there's so much information. So the brevity on the front, but there's just the, as much a depth of information as they could possibly want regarding the, the building and the history and, and the uh, current status of it. So it's a, I, we're in a good place to be putting this out on the street. So. I need a few more comments. I'm sorry, Diane. I, I Cut you off. Oh, I, I was just going to ask if I can make a few more comments. I do agree; it's, it's a very well written RFP. Um, minor detail is that I would avoid second person, but that's that's neither here nor there. Um, I am going to go back to something that I had raised earlier, and I don't think that this I don't think that this uh, lowers our chances of people responding, but I still feel that the town should express some expectation that whatever is done is going to be either sustainable or environmentally responsible. And I don't see any language that that alludes to that. I think it can still be wrapped into the existing criteria that we have. But you know, anybody who's going to do any work on a building needs to be paying attention to that. Well the the restoration preservation of historic buildings is a green strategy. You Absolutely. are preserving um, a beautiful, significant piece of architecture to bring it into the 21st century in terms of how its operational costs are addressed is very important. And um, I do think we might need to discuss a little bit more about the degree of restoration and preservation that we're, we would be comfortable with because a Victorian era house in the shingle style has its significance 
because of certain architectural features, uh, like the porches projecting out, the recesses, uh, the bunching of the windows, the open floor plans, um, the fact that it's called shingle style because the roof was shingled, the walls were shingled. Um, which of these components do we think need to be restored and preserved? Um, the minimum is to recycle the building as it is. The maximum would be a total restoration, which we all agree is not feasible. So the degree in between those two extremes is, I don't have a clear idea what they are. Now I've talked to John about my hopes that the main street elevation, which is the south and the <laughs> west elevation would be preserved as much as possible because those are the most public views. And where the additions have been applied on the east and north, uh, if those additions are removed, that's where the developers have the most opportunity to modify the structure and make it more workable. Um, those are the things I would like to see discussed so we have a better understanding of what degree of preservation and restoration we're looking for. Well, the top um, the top evaluation criteria is restoration and preservation of the structure. So it's going to, I think, in part be what what the proposers uh, are willing and able to do and make financially viable. And then based on what they're willing and able to do, this committee selecting the respondent that we think is going to do the most and the best job for us. And that's what we would uh, we would focus on until we know what people are willing to do or able to do. Um, you know, it's really going to be a decision, a, a relative decision in terms of what the proposals look like. On the front end, we, we consciously made a decision not to determine what has to be done. But in discussions, uh, once we start to hone in, I think, on a, a potential partner, um, I think there's opportunity or should be opportunity for further discussions about the things that we'd like to prioritize. But yeah, I don't I know that we can, I don't know that we can do that now. It seems uh, premature. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I appreciate Diana's point. I don't know that we need to break out another selection criteria for it because it's going to come up in a number of different ways. If someone proposes five acres of impervious surface, they're going to get the gong, right? The, the zoning bylaws also um, regulate some of this stuff that we'll be able to point to. You still got to comply with with that, but I don't know that we want to go adding a you've got to be a lead gold building or something like that. I, I I that's sort of my thought. It's preservation first. Yeah, I I've got some. I'm just make, making notes in the document. I think there's a logical and um, simple way to put a, a sustainability note note in the um, yeah in category yeah. one. And Diane, if you have any language that you um, think would be particularly um, helpful or thoughtful, send it along and I'm happy to incorporate that. And on the, the preservation side of things, um, you know, there's the, part of my job is to, is to tell you things straight. And frankly, um, the alternatives to whatever someone proposes um, that the town has are almost non-existent in this in the form of preservation and restoration. You do not have um, the capacity or the wherewithal um, to fund a public restoration and uh, preservation program on this building. And that's the reality of the situation. And so to the extent you are relying on the public sector, I mean, the private sector to um, deliver a, a, a feasible use, um, you're relying on them to take the notations and the, the guidance from the, not just the RFP, but the tour and the, and the discussions with the town and all of the, all of the touch points that they're going to have with the, the town and the community um, relative to preservation and restoration. Um, aside from that, you know, there are, there are benchmarks for uh, federal and state tax credits, if that's a route they end up going, they are on notice that you intend to put a preservation restriction or, or some other mechanism on the property going forward. Um, so there's, there shouldn't, if this nothing should be surprise, um, 
um, to, to a developer or a buyer. I just don't know how much we can say is a must um, at this point. I had a couple questions uh, regarding the document. Um, first one's an easy one. So at some point, certainly we're thinking something with hospitality, but that's not addressed in this document. So we really do want to keep it wide open at this point. Yes. Okay. Um, the second thing is when I looked at it, uh, I won't say I'm confused, but it's not clear to me. So we have a project evaluation criteria. We have one through five. On selection criteria, we have one through three. How come it's not one through five? So when I look at the document, right, you have, uh, let me see, I'm looking at mine just to make sure I know what I'm talking about. We have um, project evaluation criteria, restoration and preservation of the structure, number two, reduction of the white cliffs burden on municipal finances, number three, landscaping, number four, public access, number five, uh, linking it to master plan and downtown revitalization. Then when I go down to the section where you have selection criteria, I only have three. I have uh, the team submission criteria, I have the total project proposal criteria, and then the last one is project proposal criteria guidance. So uh, for some reason, I, I guess I expect it to be five and five. Is there something I'm missing I don't understand? So the five pro uh, pro proposal criteria, project proposal criteria are baked into the three subcategories. So we prime the well initially by saying, here are the five major components of um, evaluation that we're really focused on. These are the, the things that we need to explain. These are, the, these are the, um, the, the committee's priorities. And then the so selection criteria um, include that those five, but in addition to that, there's some of the, the basic stuff we need. We need to know who you are. We need to know some references. We're going to have interviews. Um, and we also have um, some guidance on project summary. Because we're not doing the, the punch card, um, sort of a punch list approach where you must submit this form, you must submit this description that includes all of these things. Um, I'm, we're leaving that a little bit open and flexible so that people can be creative as to how they present this. Um, and do what works for them and what makes sense. Um, because this is unique and to put a, a big wire frame around something and say, we need X, Y, and Z. Um, I think we've all been in those conversations where some of those punch list items just aren't gonna be applicable to certain, uh, to certain respondents. So we have those three final kind of guidance that we're gonna, we're gonna grade you on as well. Got it, thank you, Brett. I, want, I didn't want to put it put those those the narrative description of the criteria after um, we talked about it because I thought it would be you know helpful to know what's important first and then go and see the sort of um, administrative and, and technical stuff. Got it. To that point, I think it's good that there's five five project criteria, because if you start adding up the points, those get more, mm -hmm. uh, no, they, they no, get they a heavier do. weight, right? They do. Mm -hmm. And that's really, uh, I th for me, the most important. I don't know about the rest of you. Yeah, I mean, if you add the, you know, so if you add the the other stuff, the admin together individually, they weigh less. Um, but you know, they're they're a larger. Um, there there are more. There are um, you know seven uh, of those bullet points, and and that helps to to balance that, right? That the that the project proposal criteria are really important, but also if you if if th those things are great, and none of your other submissions make any sense, and your financing doesn't make sense, and your interview is terrible, and all of those things we want we want some some amount of balance so that it's not just the soft um, submission but it's also the technical stuff as well okay um 
And how do you, uh, how do you want us to proceed? Because I I can go into the edit mode. This is a couple of questions I have. Should I just go through the edit mode and then forward that to you, Brett? Or... Yes, please. I would suggest that for everyone that just track your changes or write in a different color in a Word document and send it to me and I'll, I'll take a look at all of those um, over the next few days and incorporate that. Should we be sending also a copy to someone on staff? Sorry about that. Um, however, you, however the chair and, and, and the, uh, the town want to deal with this, if you want to. Yeah, why don't you copy through. myself yeah. uh, and, uh, uh, and Lori on those? With anything that comes in and just so we can kind of see it and mm -hmm. we'll do a little bit of um uh just making sure that it all makes sense okay we'll do and one of the things that we had um sort of touched on earlier is logistics and and i i've left some holes in there john that we, we've met, i've talked about briefly of you know who has custody of, of the list and, and who manages how this RFP goes out. And so I am entirely flexible. I, I don't want to step on any toes if the town has a, uh, a comfort level with administering the, you know, holding the documents and- the I'm perfectly comfortable with you taking care of everything. <laughs> that's fine too. Um, so, okay, so I'll, I'll assume that that's the case and I'll make some, um, there's going to be a couple of things that I um, yeah I mean normally on my end the assistant town administrator is our procurement officer and she's okay. out on leave at the moment so it would be helpful to me it just needs to be one person that's tracking in compliance with the uh, procurement laws making sure that uh, you know, everything's getting logged that the that uh, the addendum is going out to anybody of record uh, and so forth. Okay. And since you're going to be reaching out to people, you know, they can reach out to you with questions that, that yeah, makes the most sense. It's so really be, easy to, um, to just create a new tab in the database that has the, the people who, who are going to receive the RFP and right. that list to them. Okay. Is that it? So how do we want to proceed? Do we want one more swipe at blessing the RFP here uh, once uh, the final information is in? Um, or is the committee comfortable with edits uh, beyond this? You know, the meat of it is in the comparative criteria. As I said, a lot of this is boilerplate, non-collusion, things of that nature. The legal references will be reviewed by council to make sure that we're giving everybody uh, proper notice in terms of the, the process that we'll have to follow. I'm okay with you guys running with it from here. I mean, I think the important thing is getting it on the street. And what's the what's the the goal here for getting this on the street? Is uh, I think we had originally talked about the end of the month. It's the twenty, what is it twenty? Today's twenty second. So getting it out next week was that is that a reasonable goal, Brett? What do we yeah, want to give? Long. Again, it depends on how much feedback. But if there's more changes. By all means, we can mm -hmm. compile those and meet again to review, make sure everybody's on the same page. But materially, I don't know how much is is going to is going to be amended. Yeah, I think that's probably reasonable, and then we can figure out what we need from a compliance perspective with all of the you know um, procurement uh, rules and advertising, et cetera. It would probably end up on the street uh, October fifth. Um, that's when it would be published in the central register. So that's, that's kind of the, that's the longest lead item as far as getting it um, advertised correctly. Yeah. It's a week. Uh, we got to get it in a week before it appears. Right. Yep. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll keep that as a target. And um, if we need a little extra time for edits and things, we can, push that a little bit yeah it'll it'll be in one week increment so if it's if yeah. working backwards if the fifth is the that is the goal to get it on the street that needs to be submitted to the central register about a week before which means you know it's got to be it's got to be all wrapped up so if we it's fine i mean i don't think a week either way is going to make or break this project and i don't want to rush anybody we can review it as much as you all would like but 
just want to begin with the end in mind in terms of when do we want on the street, work our way backwards. And in advance of that, I know we had discussed, um, I'm going to send you an email, John, uh, to, to make sure we've captured all the data that we, you've got on file. And if not, we'll, we'll get that. And also, I, we'd spoken with um, um, uh, the committee about this not that long ago, but in advance of sort of site tours and things like that, we want to make sure that somebody's taken a, a weed whacker to some of the weeds and things no, like no, that. No, we were out there today. That's all, it's all in the works. All right. DPW is I met with DPW this morning. Uh, going through, we're gonna gonna clean up the property as much as we can. Great. Uh, we're not paint. We're not painting. No, and, no, no. Uh, I just and rebuilding just the, anything, but the, we'll the clean tree, the parking you know, lot the, up, take out the dead trees, and, yeah, and the so saplings forth. that we're growing in the parking lot. Run probably. a quick vacuum through the place. You know, make yep. it look pretty. That's perfect. Yep. Uh, right. While we have everybody through the chair, uh, it might be helpful. Uh, so Lori and I met with uh, Brian uh, Pfeiffer. He's an architectural historian with uh, Preservation Advisory Services. And basically he was the individual that came out to do the assessment for the, uh, the Preservation Mass Most Endangered list, uh, which we've applied to. So we spent what, over two hours with him today, Lori, uh, this morning, uh, and uh, listened to his kind of thoughts and assessment of, of the property. I'll just say first and foremost, he was very impressed with the uh, quality and state of the historic part of the building. And he couldn't say enough about what the town had done in the interim to preserve the building envelope and minimize, and this was Brett's kind of uh, response to, to touring through the building as well, to, to minimize further deterioration of the historic part of the building. So the things that we did with uh, putting the roof on, Boarding the windows, uh, eliminating the water penetrations and so forth, uh, the dehumidification that was going on in the place. Um, he was, it was quite, I think he was quite impressed with the state of the historic portion of the building. So, um, but he did, you know, indicate that uh, I, I, I think, I don't know, Laura, you can correct me if I'm wrong in terms of perception, but um, I think he was pretty, um, pretty hot to advocate for us. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, of course you don't do what he does if you don't like old buildings and historic buildings and want to preserve them. But he, uh, he was like a kid in a candy store going through the place, frankly. I mean, he stopped and had to look at the, the manufacturer of every hinge on every door on every floor. I mean, that was the level that he was, uh, he was intrigued by this. Um, so it was good. I think we have in, uh, in our assessor. Uh, for this uh, process, I think we had somebody who really got what the community is trying to do. I think the thing he was impressed with most was the fact that um, rather than just coming to them and saying this place is falling down, it's in, in, it's in disrepair, uh, help us, that we had taken all the logical steps that he would have thought an organization would take um, to be in a position to, to, to save the building. So the, so I'm like, I asked him if he had any advice for us. He said his, his advice is to you know, stabilize the building, fix the roof, all the things that we've already done. Uh, beyond that, um, you know, we talked to him about the RFP process and trying as best we can to link up this uh, preservation mass most endangered list nomination and, and potential award uh, with our, with our um, marketing campaign for our finding a partner. One of the, I think one of the real benefits and, and um, that came out of the discussions with, uh, with uh, this individual was by going through this process, he's like, you're basically putting your project under the nose of anybody in the state who would want to know or be interested in your project. So just by the nomination application that Lori put together and getting that in and this process alone will get us uh, some additional interest in, in, the, in the project. Timing it with the RFP, uh, he, was, he was of the opinion, I think that that, uh, that, was, a good, um, that was a good timing and process that this is gonna marry together for us nicely in terms of marketing and, um, and getting just, again, getting, it's one thing to advertise, it's another to really get it under the nose of people who, who normally engage in this type of, of uh, restoration or reuse project, which is the same thing we've heard from Brett from the beginning. So, Lori, I don't know if you have anything else to, to add from our, our tour. We spent two hours with him. He was a wealth of information, gave Lori and I some 
some additional contacts for potential grants uh, and uh, preservation, um, uh, folks holding the preservation restriction, things of that nature. And uh, so he's on my list as another resource, but uh, very, very, um, very pleasant individual with a lot of with a lot of knowledge and information. So, Lloyd, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, I mean, uh, just as John mentioned, I think overall it was a positive experience. I think that he thinks we have something really special. And, uh, you know, certainly he uh, felt our pain as far as how daunting the project is. Um, but he really was amazed with uh, the quality of a lot of the features and uh, how he kept mentioning how solid the building was and how the floors didn't creak and um, just the structure. He was fascinated by uh, the basement and to see all of the arches, uh, the, the brick arches in the basements. Um, and just how well made the building was. So he did mention that there are a number of developers that sit on the selection committee. And he's like, these are the people that uh, we want to be aware of your project. So I think overall it was a win-win and I'm, I'm glad that we're going through this process regardless of what happens. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's going to help us in terms of elevating the uh elevating the um, uh, profile at just at the right time as we're, we're trying to get this out on the street. The only other caveat <laughs> he did mention was, you know, we need to be, at, you know, we need to be flexible and, and to preserve the building, you know, we get as much as we can, but if you don't get, if you don't get anything, you don't save the building. So be flexible was his word of advice to us. So. Can someone send me his contact information so I can add to my database? Absolutely. Great. Laura, yeah. you, you, you send yeah, it to I, me. I can absolutely do that. I'll do that right now. Okay. All right. I think that all fell under the category of other business. Um, <laughs> is there any other other business? So are we... Uh, it's just I want to clear that the staff has uh, its marching orders. Are we looking at uh, trying to get it advertised in the central register October 5th. So that's when it would hit the street and working up from backwards from there. If anybody have any comments or tweaks to the RFP to get them to Brett, Lori and I, and uh, we'll incorporate them as appropriate. Does that make sense? That makes sense. You realize the 28th is uh, next, uh, next Wednesday coming, right? Yeah. We just, I mean, you look at the RFP, you're adding a couple of dates in there. Uh, you know, it's really the logistics of the timeline and the dates. Oh, That's perfect. what's primarily what's left to be, to be added. So I'm excited. I have a question in the minutes um, for other business in the minutes, it stated that we would get a mold um, report or a mold remediation report. Is, is that forthcoming? Yeah, yeah, we had the what we had done initially was the assessment, uh, and then we've been doing being, uh, doing the dehumidification. So the dehumidification is working, but the building has you know it's it's musty and moldy. So, um, uh, but we had the original assessment that was done just prior to us putting the dehumidification in. So uh, there's a report. I think Sean has that report, Scott. Yeah, we we have the report. It's um, it, it's available. Um, and I believe it's also part of Brett's package uh, for attachments that go out to, in, in the RFP. So how would how would we get it? Well, we can we make that. We can distribute it. It's, yeah. It's a, yeah. It's, you kind of like that it's a tech. It's a very technical report, um, but uh, you know, That's uh, what I do. So you can <laughs> skip it. It's moldy. You know, I mean, it's an old, it's closed old old building. So. There is some mold issues, but the humidification level is under control in there. Uh, Sean, uh, Sean uh, Thompson, our facilities manager, has done a, done a great job uh, getting that stuff set up and running it. And I we can tried to isolate the back of the building. Some of the old additions, I mean, they we know from DB, DBBW's initial assessment, you know, that there's water infiltration. We're just trying to keep that 
humidity out of the historic side of the building as much as we can. But until you do a demo of those buildings or replace those flat roofs on the additions, which I don't think anybody wants to do because there's a good chance they're going to be torn down. Uh, absent that, you know, there's going to continue to be just fighting that. You know, anytime you have an un, uh, un, unconditioned in terms of heating and cooling uh, space, it's, uh, it's difficult to maintain the humidity level. So. Okay. Great. Last call. Yeah, can I just say one thing? Um, Brett, I think it was really beneficial and helpful to all the boards and committees that you visited and even just getting exposure out to the town. Not everybody watches Board of Selectmen, but they might watch planning or historic district. And um, I, I hope you enjoyed it. I, I, I think everybody else enjoyed it too. <laughs> yes, it was lovely. And I think I've still got one left to do um, with Norm. Yeah, we had a scheduling challenge, but we're on to the 11th. So at that point, what we'd be looking for from you, Brett, is just a status report, because mm -hmm. that would be great. Yeah, part of it is just to make sure everybody's in the loop and feels um, like they're part of the exercise, because they are. Yeah. And I wanted to just, before we leave, say I had a wonderful time at the Apple Festival on Saturday. <laughs> Beautiful day. So I was looking for the dunk tank, John. I couldn't find it. So. Well, enough people found it. I can assure you. <laughs> I spent uh, spent a lot of time in the water. <laughs> do uh, do we want to pick a, a date uh, next meeting? Well, I'm not sure what would be appropriate based on the fact that we're going to put this out on the street. It's going to marinate for a while. I'm not sure what else there is for the committee to do in the interim, but. Well, in the interim, we'll get, we're going to get a visit, right? So. Yeah, but that doesn't, uh, right, we're, we're going to schedule that around when we, when we do the walkthrough, what I'd like to do is when, once we pick a date for the walkthrough for the, for the uh, uh, contractors and the developers, uh, that'll be sort of you know, trying to get the place in, in as appropriate condition as we can for people to be in the building, which means picking up, uh, we may pull all the cords for that are running all around the floors for all of the dehumidification, you know, for, for a temporary basis. That's when I would, then that's when we would do it. So, uh, so when we picked it, I think we picked the date for that walkthrough and then we can, uh, we can uh, pick a, pick a time for, uh, for the committee to get in there around that after, you know, DBW cleans things up, make sure that it's uh, as safe as it can be. So, so I don't know. That's not necessarily. That's not going to be a scheduled meeting. That's you know because you're not going to be deliberating or taking any from any information. Uh, right. You'd just be in you know a tour of the building, and that's pretty much it. So that wouldn't be a posted meeting because there'll be no public. What I would like is uh, when it goes out, uh, when the final version goes out, if you could just text up, email us that has gone out and then send us all the members a copy of the final product that went out uh, for a week. And then at some point we probably should have another meeting, but probably not till uh, that's that start to get feedback on that. Yeah, and I'm also, I, I'm gonna to put together a quick little um, couple of sentences and, and with a link in, in, um, in case anyone wants to share it on social media or LinkedIn oh. or something like that, that we can, um, probably next week so we can start priming the well saying that the RFP is going to be out on the streets soon. Uh, we'd like to get the, certainly the local newspapers involved with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Laura Hayes is uh, interested in doing a, a um, another story. She's from the Community Advocate. She does a great job for us. So what does that mean in terms of our uh, next meeting? I'm thinking, wait until you know we start getting feedback. Does that make sense, Todd? Yeah, I, I'm not. You know, I, I I don't feel a need to schedule something until there's something to do. Hmm. And so, be. if it goes out on the if it goes out on October fifth or there about uh, either October fifth or twelfth, uh, you know, because uh, it would be a week to do the central register. If it goes out, then you want to leave it out 
uh, for 60 days. Yes. So October, November. So I mean, realistically, we're looking at December then. Do we want to? Okay. Or we can just wait to, to, to pick a date. How long will the committee have? I, guess, I suppose this depends on how many responses we get, but I assume we'll have a week or two to review responses before we meet. Oh, it, it, yeah, as much the time as you need. Yeah. So maybe that's it. That when the when the responses come in, we package them up, send them out to everybody, and then we'll schedule a meeting that's appropriate at that time. Not going to make okay. you work over Christmas. <laughs> okay. Great. I could make a motion to adjourn. Is that that's appropriate? Second. <laughs> Love you guys. All right. <laughs> Uh, let's start with uh, Diana. Yes. Julianne. Yes. Norm. Yes. Do we lose Tom? Yes. All right. Well, that's enough. Meeting adjourned. All right. Take care, guys. We'll see you in a while. Thank you, everybody. Right.